Welcome everyone to Construction Professional Liability Insurance, Why You Need a Specialist. Thank you all so much for joining us. Today's presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available in Academy within two business days. As you have questions, you may post them in the Zoom Q&A function and we will answer questions at the end of the call. We will try our best to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question today, please email learning at nfp.com. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Joining us today is Cynthia Olinger, Senior Vice President of Construction at NFP. We're very excited to have her speaking with us today. It is my pleasure to hand over the call to our speaker. Cynthia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amber. Hi, everyone. Um, as Amber introduced, I'm Cynthia Olinger. I'm the Senior Vice President, Head of the Professional Liability Practice at NFP. Um, my background is I'm an engineer by education. I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in civil and environmental engineering. I was a practicing engineer for a few years before joining the insurance industry. I specialize in professional liability as it relates to construction. So when we're talking about that, we're referring to architects and engineers, general contractors, trades, uh, design build contractors, as well as owners and developers, all of whom can be impacted by professional liability exposures. I'll give you a moment to read this quick disclaimer. Um, And then we'll get into it. So um, professional liability is a complex form of liability insurance. Um, I'll break down professional liability to give you a better understanding of what it is, who should be thinking about it, how to evaluate your exposures, what can be done to mitigate your exposures, and how insurance can help with all of the above. Um, as I said, professional liability is complex and the details really do matter. It's important to deal with a true expert, especially in the construction space, as we can help you to provide better protection for your work and your projects, which might also mean saving you money, whether that be through um, your insurance premiums or in mitigating your overall losses. So we're gonna start this discussion by talking about what we mean by professional liability. Um, we have a definition shown here, legal liability for damages arising out of actual or alleged negligent acts, errors, omissions, et cetera, in the rendering of or failure to render professional services. Um, that liability or damages can take several types of forms, which are shown here, and I'll talk through each of those. The first being economic loss. So economic loss on a project can be discovered during or at any point after construction. This can include things like additional design or construction costs due to the error that was discovered. Um, if the error results in a project delay, that might result in lost revenue to the owner of the project or developer of the project on the back end um, in the form of delayed opening or loss of rents. That's also considered an economic loss. Um, after project completion, the loss might be more severe because it might cost more to fix if it requires some additional construction or fixing something that's already been done. The ultimate liability for the economic damages usually lies with the owner or developer of the project, but you can be sure that if you're involved with the project at any level, um, you're likely to get involved with a claim. The second type of damage that you can realize as a result of professional liability is bodily injury. Um, this would be in the event that a professional service provided on a job causes injury to one or more people. A perfect example of this is a mold claim. Let's say there was a faulty uh, plumbing or, or sprinkler system, faulty roof, windows, exterior finishing system, all of the above have led to mold losses if there's an error in the design of any of those systems, you can get a bodily injury claim as a result of mold that develops. Um, another type of damage is property damage. And this refers to property damage to a third party's property. A good example of this would be, um, we had a client with a claim where they had performed demolition on a job site and um, the, a, a nearby neighborhood alleged damages to their properties, so the homeowner, homeowners in that neighborhood alleged damages to, the, damages to their individual properties that resulted 
from the demolition activities on the project site. Then we have fines, penalties, punitive damages, et cetera, that can be included in professional liability damages and then claim expenses. You know, I don't think that we can overstate the importance of making sure that your claim expenses are covered for your professional liabilities. These um, can be severe. So now we'll talk about what we're referring to when we are talking about professional services. Historically, professional services, as they relate to construction, were associated with more traditional design activities. So that would be you know, your architects and engineers or anyone that is stamping drawings um, were considered to be the professional service providers on a construction project. And, you know, for a long time, people thought if you weren't stamping drawings, then you don't have exposure for professional liability. Unfortunately, the thinking on this has evolved tremendously over the past decade or so, um, as the construction industry itself has evolved and also as case law around professional services and construction has evolved. Now we consider that professional services include all of the activities that are listed here on this slide and more. This is just a really good start, but you can see that you know things like interior design, I would say you know, 20 years ago, nobody really thought of having a professional liability exposure for that. Um, then we've got some more you know, technical consultant or technology services that are now provided in conjunction with other professional services that you might be providing on a project. Um, you know, all of these are now considered in the, the broad definition of professional services. Um, you know, so this impacts not only architects and engineers and traditional designers now, but the general contractors, trades, you know, specifics of your contracting activities and contract vehicles are going to impact your professional liability significantly. So if you're subbing out some of these services, for example, or subbing out design services, then it's gonna have a severe impact to your professional liability exposure. I would say at the end of the day that even um, contractors that don't have any design responsibility, we would tell you that you have some level of professional liability exposure. You know, we were gonna to refer to that as more of an incidental exposure just by nature of being on a job site and you know, you make a call in the field and change something ever so slightly. Now you've gotten yourself into a professional liability realm. So whether or not you carry professional liability insurance already, you should be thinking about it and talking to an expert to assess whether it's something you really should invest in. So now we're going to talk about, you know, who's impacted by professional liability exposures. We've talked a lot about service providers, you know, if something goes wrong on one of your projects, you will be impacted whether you were the one that you know, performed the negligent act or not. Um, again, you should be thinking about not only the services that you provide yourself, but also services that you subcontract out to other parties. Um, just by nature of holding that contract and responsibility for those services, you will be involved in any type of loss. At the end of the day, professional liability claims are messy and prolonged. Typically, multiple parties involved with the project will get brought into a claim. It will end with an allocation of responsibility. Um, usually, there's not one party that's ultimately held responsible. Um, other parties that might have contributed to the loss um, usually get involved as well. As you can imagine, um, when there is a professional liability loss, there is a lot expended on defense of the claim on your behalf. So we see substantial defense costs involved with this process. So uh, other than service providers, owners need to be thinking about professional liability, owners and developers, that is. You need to be considering all of the above. How much exposure would you have from all the various services that are being provided on your projects? How much exposure do you have from all the various service providers? And how much of this ultimately are you able to control? All of the above are what we're gonna look at when we're considering your professional liability exposure. There are many factors that we consider when we're assessing the professional liability exposures for owners 
or service providers. There are some particularly complicating factors, some of which we've listed here. Um, you know, broad scope of service providers involved with a job we've talked about. Um, complex contractual arrangements can um, complicate your professional liability exposure substantially. So, you know, type of contract, for example, um, can significant, significantly impact your exposure because it will complicate the flow of liabilities. So if you're talking about traditional delivery method, design build, bid build versus design build versus integrated project delivery, et cetera, the more complex your contracts get, the more complex your exposures get. We look at terms and conditions of these contracts, particularly what is indemnified, what are the flow of indemnify, indemnities, who's indemnifying whom, are there limitations of liability provided on your behalf in the contract? And you know, these are considerations for both service providers and owners. Certain terms are beneficial to one party versus another. When you engage a professional liability expert, we can help you understand your contracts and how the terms and conditions of those contracts impact your liability with respect to professional services in particular. At the end of the day, the whole, whole point of this is to understand what your contracts say, what they do for you, what, what liabilities you retain. Your contracts always should be your first line of defense. You know, before you even start thinking about insurance, you wanna focus on your contracts, get those nice and tight. At the end of the day, when you do start talking about insurance, you need to make sure your insurance broker understands the details of your contracts so they can appropriately plan and design an insurance program around the liabilities that you retain by contract. Then finally, new technologies really complicate professional liability exposure. We're talking about new technologies, both for individual projects and then just industry-wide developments in the construction space. We've had a lot of um, new products and technologies come into play in the last few years that really should be evaluated closely. So when we're talking about individual projects, it's, think of things like sports stadiums. Every sports stadium seems to have a new innovative technology involved and that can present substantial exposure from a professional liability standpoint should something go wrong with the innovative design. As far as industry-wide technologies, think about things like building information modeling. Um, there was a survey performed by Dodge Data and Analytics where 73% of the US contractors surveyed reported that they use BIM on at least one project. Keep in mind that BIM is used during the life cycle of a building. So should something go wrong during construction, after construction, or any point in the near future, you could be impacting, in, impacted. One of the more recent trends in construction would be something like digital twin building simulations and smart buildings. You know, the use of that technology is pretty new and it'll be interesting to see how that propagates throughout the construction industry, but that can present some particular ch challenges from a professional services standpoint. Then something like 3D printing, we've started to see the use of 3D printing by art architects in particular, because 3D printers can produce complex shapes. Um, it, it remains to be seen whether that is going to be used for more traditional components in the near future, um, but it's something to definitely keep an eye on and think about the implications for using 3D printing on a project to your professional liability exposure. And then finally, um, you know, we've started to see more industrialized and componentized construction incorporated into construction projects. By this, we mean um, pre-assembled pre-assembled building components and modules. Um, they often come along with some form of technological innovation. Um, these have come into favor because they provide for increased speed of delivery, also improved quality and environmental sustainability. All of which are great, but how does that, again, impact your professional liability exposure? 
um, particularly if expectations around the use of that technology are set and then not met, especially from a schedule standpoint. So all of the above really gets down to, you know, why you need to be engaging with um, a professional liability specialist for construction. Um, this really all starts with understanding your business and your exposures. And that's really where the focus should start. So from an operations standpoint, when we're talking about service providers, we look at what are you actually doing? Are you designing? Are you just building? Are you doing both? Um, wh whatever the answer to that question is, impacts your professional liability exposure. But then we, you got to dig a little deeper than that and look into, okay, based on what you're doing, what kind of QA, QC procedures do you have in place? What kind of training are you providing? What type of oversight is performed on your projects, either you know, in-house or by a third party? You know, the same question goes to owners. What, what is involved with your project and how are you managing that? What kind of oversight do you provide? All of this can help you understand your exposures better when we dig into what you're actually doing to mitigate your professional liability exposures. Then we look at things like project types and, and sizes, quite frankly. So um, certain projects are going to have a higher likelihood of professional liability claims than others. So think residential, especially something like a high-end condominium. We get a lot of claims on those projects because you end up with unhappy homeowners um, and they just tend to have a lot more claim activity, maybe not as much severity. Um, something like a hospital where you have a sensitive population using the end product. You need to consider how that impacts your professional liability versus a commercial project or a heavy civil project. Those might have a lower likelihood of claims, possibly a higher potential for severity. I mentioned project size before as well, there is some correlation of you know, size of loss with size of project. You can imagine if you have to um, rebuild port a portion of a $10 million project versus a $100 million project, the impacts from a professional liability loss standpoint are probably going to be different. So we look at all of the above and you know, to the extent that you're a GC or a trade contractor, design build contractor, we might be looking at your portfolio of projects. You might be doing something in all these different spaces. So we're going to look at that and just help you understand what the implications to your professional liability exposures might be. Then we're going to look at your contractual responsibilities, both, again, for the service provider and the owner. Who is responsible for what on these projects? How does it impact you? So first of all, who is responsible for the design? Design you know, isn't the, the only route for professional liability exposure as we've discussed, but it's really important to understand that. Is it a design build contract or is the architect and design team contracted separately? What activities are being sub subcontracted? Again, important for both contractors and owners. So for a contractor, you're going to have a lot less control over the practices of your subcontractors than you would over your own activities. For an owner, you need to understand who is responsible for what and what insurance they're carrying. At the end of the day, the question is, how do you protect yourself best by your contract? And that really comes down to very specific contract terms that a professional liability specialist can help you understand and implement. All this is it comes down to being informed best about the risks that you're taking on. Every construction project is going to have professional liability risks. You, you just need to understand what those are. Then we get to exploring mitigation strategies. Again, first line of defense is not insurance here. We'd start with your corporate processes, QAQC, training, oversight, all that we've talked about. That should be a, a core part of your risk management strategy. Then we look to contracts. Again, line of defense before insurance. Make sure that you have the most favorable contract terms to mitigate your risk. And a specialist can help you understand all of the above. Insurance is intentionally last on this list because this really is meant to be a backstop 
to all of the above to proper risk management and contracting practices. Once you have the uh, understand your exposures and have, have addressed your mitigation strategies, like I said, the last on that list was insurance. So we get to actually talking about insurance. So when we talk about insurance, we're not just gonna run out and try to place you a new policy. <clears throat> Most contractors will have some form of professional liability coverage. If you don't, we would talk you through that. For project owners, your design team and your contractor most likely is bringing some professional liability insurance coverage to the project. So the first step in all of this is understanding what you have if you already have professional liability insurance available to you or to your project. And then we assess what, what might you need above and beyond that. Not everybody is going to need more insurance. Maybe you only want to provide what is required by contract. Owners, maybe you might think that what is being provided to your project is sufficient. We would help you understand that. When we've determined that we want to pursue additional insurance for you or for your project, um, then we get into what would the structure of that program look like? What kind of program would you be buying? Professional liability policies for the construction industry have several different coverage sections. Not everybody needs all of them. So my recommendation is that you be very strategic about what you actually buy, buy the coverage sections that you need, understand why you're getting them. If you, for example, if you are a contractor and you are not subcontracting any work, your insurance can look very different from a contractor who is subcontracting a lot of work. Also, if you're a design build contractor versus um, typically involved with traditional delivery methods, you, you would want certain coverage sections to cover your exposure for design responsibility versus someone who doesn't have any responsibility for design. It's really important to understand all of these coverages, why you need them, buy what you need, because as you can imagine, all of the above affects your pricing too. So once you've just uh, decided what structure you would like for the insurance program, then we get into the details of the terms and conditions. It's important to note that all professional liability policies for construction are placed on a surplus lines basis. What this means is that these forms are not admitted and that every policy form provided by every carrier is different. And the devil really is in the details. It's really, really important to dig into the details and pay attention to them in order to get the program right. There are things in, contained in one policy form that you have to ask for in another and vice versa. Um, so that's another reason why it's very important to have a specialist involved. We know what to ask for. Finally, I would say that whatever your insurance program does look like, it should always be anticipatory. We want your professional liability program to allow your business to operate without a lot of intervention throughout the policy term. Um, low touch, touch for you, for your broker. There should be provisions included within your policy that allow for that, such as waiver of subrogation. Most owners are gonna ask for waiver of subrogation in your contract. So definitely make sure that something like that is built into your policy. And there are any number of items that we would wanna look out for and make sure you're getting the correct terms and conditions. And then finally, um, we would look at various limit and retention options for you. Again, you, know, you might only want to provide what is required by contracts and that's fine, but we would want to recommend what we think is sufficient for you from a risk management perspective. At the end of the day, it's about giving you options, maximizing your value, and letting you decide what is the right decision for your business. For owners, the limit and retention can be a little bit different of a conversation. Again, we would want you to look, we would want to look at what your service providers are providing to your project from a professional liability limit perspective. Um, in the context of the exposures presented by your project. And then think about what you need from your service providers. Um, maybe you want to require more limit from them, or maybe you want to procure more for yourself on your own behalf. We can help you explore all of the above. All of this needs to be done in, in context, right? Of what projects we're talking about, what your contracts look like, 
and I have at the bottom here, you know, we want you to understand not only the cost, but the value of your program, because, you know, the lowest premium might not be the best value. It might, but we really need you to understand what you're getting, why you need it, and make a business decision about what you procure at the end of the day. So here's an example of, of why details matter. Um, this is a, a case law, Ace American versus um, Chapman et al. And the issue here was that um, there was a professional liability claim and the insurer denied coverage because of the policy's definition of professional services. Now, it's important to note that your definition of professional services in your professional liability policy is paramount. It, it provides the basis for what coverage you are getting under your policy. If this definition isn't right, then it, it, things can go really wrong as evidenced here. In this case, the court held that the insurer had no duty to even defend or indemnify because the alleged conduct did not arise out of an act that was contained in the definition of professional insurance, professional services in the insurance policy. The court declined to read a broader definition of professional services and the claim was denied as a result. So this is one example of the level of detail that we need to get into when we're placing a professional liability insurance policy, why we need to understand exactly what's going on with your business, with your projects that you're involved with, so we can be sure to get this correct. I have a couple case studies here just to evidence the value in working with a specialist for your professional liability program. Um, this first one is for a contractor. We had a um, potential client that had a professional liability policy that they provided to us for review just to see if we could do anything for them. So we started this process doing exactly what I've been describing here um, by talking to them and understanding their business, understanding what kind of projects they were involved with, what are their risk management protocols, and then in the context of their business and all of the above, we assessed the professional liability program that they had in place. The program that they had in place had the very basic professional liability coverages. We talked before about the different coverage sections and making sure that you're buying the correct coverage sections while not overbuying and not buying what you don't need. In this case, um, there was a significant gap in their coverages relevant to their operations. We also identified um, a pretty substantial <laughs> Um, premium, uh, overpriced premium for this um, client. So we, we went out to the professional liability markets um, that we work with and got a few different options for them, all of which included the coverage sections that they needed. So we delivered a more comprehensive program that included additional coverage sections, and we decreased their overall premium by 25%. This is a, a fairly typical result for programs for contractors that we review when they haven't been working with a professional liability specialist. A lot of um, the professional liability industry is, is placed out of London. Um, there are lots of domestic carriers that understand and really like um, the construction professional liability space, not to say that, that you can't have success in London as well, um, this particular case was placed out of London and they, they just didn't get the best program that's available. So this um, is a perfect example of how a specialist will know exactly what markets to go to, what coverages to ask for, and what your pricing should be. I could tell as soon as I reviewed this program that I could save them a substantial amount of money. The next case study um, is for a, a, an owner. This was an owner that didn't buy additional professional liability coverage. So in this case, this is, was a hospital system and they were 
um, sorry, I just got a question in, <laughs> um, asking for some more details about coverages that we added in first case study. So I will go back to that. So in this um, particular case, it was, it's what we refer to as protective indemnity and rectification coverage. So the protective indemnity is the coverage that you might, that you should have if you're subcontracting work. So we've got a couple different coverage sections for professional liability. The first being just your professional liability for you as a contractor. So that's traditional, um, that covers damages that arise from the acts of your employees. So this through the services that you provide. Another coverage section is what we call protective indemnity. And that covers a contractor for their liability that arises from the acts of their subcontractors. So that this follows, you know, privity of contract. If you're holding the contract with the owner and there's a problem on the job, they're going to come to you um, to rectify that issue. If the issue results from the acts of one of your subcontractors, you still are going to be contractually responsible to the owner. You would turn around and pres presumably pursue an action against your subcontractor. In the event that their insurance is unavailable or insufficient to cover the loss, you, as the GC, could be held responsible for the remainder of the damages that their insurance does not cover. The protective indemnity coverage provides you additional protection um, for your liability that arises from the acts of your subs. The second coverage is what we call rectification, which a, a professional liability policy typically is triggered by a demand that is made against the insured on the policy. The rectification coverage allows for you to obtain coverage for a problem that's been identified before it leads to an actual claim. So it's kind of a um, emergency response type of coverage for, um, for professional liability. So it allows you to step in and provide additional coverage um, before the actual claim arises. Hopefully that made sense. Um, so those are the two additional coverages that we provided on <clears throat> the first case study. The second case study is for an owner. And this was a hospital system that was conducting a large expansion project. When the project was almost completed, a pipe burst and flooded an entire wing of the hospital that needed to be shut down. The, um, the owner of the project pursued damages against their um, MEP uh, firm that provided the design for the pipe and did recover some insurance, but there were several million in damages that were uninsured because their MEP contractor had insufficient professional liability limits. Um, we were involved with this owner throughout the process. We helped them, you know, we got involved at the contracting stage, helped them review their contracts, um, recommended professional li liability limits to obtain from their serv service providers, you know, all of the above, all of what we've been talking about. Um, we came to them at the end of the day after assessing all the professional liability limits available on the project, the exposures of the project, and recommended an owner's policy in order to provide additional professional liability limits to the project. They ultimately decided not to buy the owner's professional liability policy. And as a result, they had to... Um, the cost of the several million in uninsured damages that resulted from the pipe bursting on their project. The owner policy that we recommended could have supplemented the insurance that would have been available to pay for professional liability damages. At the end of the day, they just decided not to buy it. But that's a, a policy that we help owners and developers assess all the, all the time, whether the limits to their project are sufficient or whether they should pursue additional insurance to protect themselves from a loss just like this one. So, I, you know, 
bringing this to a close, um, the takeaway messages here are that your professional liability exposures need to be evaluated in the context of what are your operations, what are your projects, what are your other risk management procedures, um, your contracting activities, et cetera. Um, once we've assessed your exposures, then you know, we look to the content, the content of what your insurance policies provide and help you understand what you have and what you need. So I'm gonna to go to the Q&A here. Um, the first question I have here is, is there a proposal template that can be used for future instances, maybe one that is used for the case studies? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have various versions of proposal templates. Um, we really would wanna look at the specifics of what we're talking about. So, you know, I'm gonna have one for an owner versus a contractor, um, but we would go a little bit deeper depending on the types of exposures that we're talking about. So um, I would say, let's, let's reconnect and talk about exactly what you need there. Um, let's see, okay, then I have another question. How is pipe bursting and water damage professional liability? Wouldn't this be standard general liability? So not if it was determined that the pipe was under designed for the capacity. And that was, and, and I apologize, I left out some details there, but at the end of the day, it was decided that um, it, it was actually a valve that was under designed for the capacity of the flow that was meant to go through it. And that's considered a professional liability professional liability is specifically excluded from general liability policies. Um, next question, what size of accounts are eligible to review of contracts, project, et cetera? Does a project have to be over a certain size? Generally, no. Um, we are very efficient at reviewing contracts. I pretty much know exactly where to look for, for what I need to know. Um, happy to review contracts really for any size of account or project. Whether um, for a project in particular, whether buying additional professional liability insurance is going to be efficient for that project will depend, um, efficient economically, that's going to depend to a certain extent on the size. As far as size of contractors in particular, I would say that no, we don't have a minimum we should be talking to all of our contractor clients about professional liability. And um, they're, they're really, you know, certain markets will have minimum premiums, but we can find a good fit, a good insurance solution for any size contractor. So does anyone have any other questions? Okay, here's one. I usually have professional insurance carriers review contracts via their legal department. Um, I would, I mean, that's not a bad practice. We like to get involved early on in the contracting stage. I think we look at the insurance contracts in a broader context than an insurance company normally would, but you know, having an insurance carrier review it is not a, a bad approach. Um, I would, I would say, you know, we'd be happy to take a look at it as well. If, if there, especially if there's something particularly complex, um, I think it's important for us to see the contracts mostly so we can anticipate how an insurance program needs to be designed. So I would say it's, it's helpful for us to get a look at those as well. Um, then I have a question. How can I talk to someone about reviewing my policy? My contact information should be, yeah, it's here on this slide here. So please feel free to reach out to me by phone or email, and I'd be happy to take a look. Do we have any other questions? What is the general time needed for an insurance quote? 
Uh, that's a tricky one. It, it, it depends. So if we're talking about for a, a contractor, um, that's going to depend a little bit on how much design build activity they have versus straight construction. But we can turn those around relatively quickly, sometimes in a day, sometimes we need most more like a week. This is all assuming we have the appropriate information. <laughs> Um, but we've got some great underwriters that can turn these around really quickly. If we're talking about a project, um, whether it's from a contractor perspective or an owner developer perspective, I would definitely give it more time, something in the two week range. I think what's most important really for answering this question is getting you information about exactly what we need in order to turn a quote around. So that's, that's going to be you know, mostly understanding their revenues, the type of work they're performing, um, we can follow up with um, example applications. I don't like to send one application um, necessarily because all the markets have different appetites. And I hate to have someone fill out one application only that end up placing business somewhere else and having to redo it. But definitely reach out and I can, I can help you understand what turnaround time would be based on the specifics of what we're talking about. Um, here we've got from a client perspective, hiring the contractor and architect, how do you value limits for the a &E based on size of architect contract or build contract? So that's a great question. So we would look at a couple of different things. First of all, would be project type. So we generally are going to recommend higher limits for certain projects than others, um, spe specifically condos, which I mentioned before, um, very high, high exposure from an owner developer perspective, but definitely project size as well. Um, that's it. So we're not looking at the size of the architect contract per se, we're looking at the size of the overall job because the insurance companies consider that their overall exposure to a professional liability loss for an architect is not the value of their contract, unless there's some sort of limitation of liability in their contract. But generally, the underwriters are going to look at what's the actual job. So if you're building, you know, a $200 million condo, we're going to recommend different limits than for a $10 million office building. Okay, so then does anyone write this in an admitted market? So that there's limited admitted policies for architects and engineers. So yes, we do see admitted carriers for that. There are no admitted carriers for contractors, professional liability or owners, professional liability. Ours, and the next question, ours are national offices for clerical staff that might total 2 million build when completed, but architect might only charge 150 for their design. Okay, so this is coming back to a limit recommendation question. Um, Tina, I would ask that maybe we just Take that offline because I'm going to have a lot of questions <laughs> that I want to dig into um, here, and I would probably want to see a, a copy of the contract. I think it's most important um, is what's happening with the limitation of liability in that contract. I think that's something that you really need to focus on. Architects often have so you know if we're advising the architect, we're we're going to want them to have a limitation of liability. If we're advising the owner, we're not, right? The limitation of liability for the architect benefits the architect only. As far as how we would approach professional liability limits, whether or not there's a limitation of liability really matters. So um, maybe we can take that question offline if you don't mind. Are there any other questions? Great, well, thank you everyone. Amber, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Cynthia, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, we recorded today's presentation and the recording will be available in Academy within two business days. Finally, at this time, I'd like to take a moment to ask you to take a short survey today. The survey will populate in a new window when you exit out of Zoom. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps us make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.